turn together to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1, 18 to 25 is our text. And let's once again give our attention to the reading of God's holy word. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, desired to put her away secretly. But when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for that which has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit, and she will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for it is he who will save his people from their sins." Now all this took place, that what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet might be fulfilled, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child, and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. And Joseph arose from his sleep. And did as the angel of the Lord commanded him, and took her as his wife, and kept her a virgin, until she gave birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. This is God's gracious word, able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Amen. Amen. Be seated, please. Join me in prayer for the preaching and hearing of God's Word. Our Lord and our God, we bless your holy name for the gift of the Holy Spirit, the one whom you have sent to reside in every believer in Jesus Christ. And we ask now for his ministry. We pray that he would enable us to understand your word. We pray that he would illumine our hearts and minds, uh, that he would shine his light upon the truth of Holy Scripture, uh, that you would accomplish all that which you have, uh, for which you have sent it forth, in our hearts, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. amen. What's in a name? That which we call a rose, by any other name, would smell as sweet. Some of you will recognize that quotation from William Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. It suggests that a name is simply a label to distinguish one thing from another, that it neither creates worth nor communicates true meaning. What's important, Shakespeare is seeking to communicate is the worth of the individual or the worth of the thing. A rose, if called something entirely different, would still smell as sweetly as it does with the name rose. It's simply a label. It doesn't define what something is or what someone is in essence. Juliet likens this to Romeo. Romeo uh, would still be the man she loves even if he had a different name. 
This, of course, is relevant to Shakespeare's play because Juliet's family, the Capulets, and Romeo's family, the Montagues, hate one another. So for the young couple to be in love is forbidden simply because of their last names. What's relevant in William Shakespeare is not relevant in biblical revelation. Names are significant designators in the scriptures. They do communicate true meaning, and especially the names of the Holy Trinity. The names by which the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are distinguished are revelatory. And they define who each person of the Holy Trinity is. So we look at our text, we'll consider two names of the Son of God. The name Jesus, which the angel informed Joseph he uh, should call his, uh, their, their child. And uh, the name Emmanuel from uh, the Emmanuel prophecy of Isaiah, quoted in our text. Now, the first 17 verses of Matthew chapter 1, Jesus' genealogy is traced from Abraham to Joseph and Mary. Verses 18 to 20 25 describe his conception and his birth, which ought to arouse in us both awe and hope. We should walk away from this text this evening in awe of what God has done in the birth of his only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. No matter how familiar the conception and birth of Jesus Christ are to us, no matter how many times we've read the story, we should stand in awe of what our God has done in the incarnation of His only begotten Son. But then we ought to be filled with hope Our passage fills Christians with hope. Fills us with the great hope through, especially through these names, the meaning of these names, Jesus and Emmanuel. So in the first place, we want to consider that the conception and birth of Jesus commands our awe. The conception and birth of Jesus Christ commands our awe, and secondly, that the the names of Jesus fill us with hope. The conception and the birth of Jesus Christ commands our awe. Jesus was conceived supernaturally. That's a conception that is shrouded in divine mystery. Isaiah's prophecy of chapter 7 and verse 14, quoted in verse 23 of our text, is introduced by a behold. It's a word that commands both attention and admiration, especially in the Old Testament scriptures. That's a word uh, that, that, that occurs again and again. Behold. In the incarnation, we have an event that is unprecedented in the history of mankind, except in, the, con- in connection with the fulfillment of this prophecy, namely that a virgin shall be with child. A virgin shall conceive. 
a child. How does a virgin a woman who hasn't entered into intimate relations with a man how does that woman conceive a child that aspect adds to the supernatural character of Christ's conception his incarnation. And the purpose of Matthew's detailed account of the conception and the birth of Jesus Christ is to establish both the wonder and the historicity of the virgin birth. We affirm its, its historical character in the, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. I remind you that the, the formation of the Orthodox Presbyterian Church is connected with historical doctrines like the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. The OPC came into existence in 1936 when Orthodox ministers and elders in the Northern Presbyterian Church stood up against unorthodoxy, insisting that fundamental doctrines, fundamental tenets of the Christian faith, such as the deity, the bodily resurrection, the visible second coming and the virgin birth of Jesus Christ were not merely theories as the unorthodox elements of the Northern Presbyterian churches were asserting, but that these were uncontested facts of Scripture. virgin shall be with child. That's a doctrine that we embrace. That's a doctrine that we confess. It's a doctrine that we believe. Because it's emblazoned on the pages of Scripture. The angel said, that which has been conceived in Mary is of the Holy Spirit. Being born of a virgin is symbolic of Jesus' sinlessness, while the conception of Jesus by the Holy Spirit guarantees his sinlessness. Had the Christ child been naturally conceived, the guilt of Adam's first sin would have been imputed to him. The, our catechism summarizes this biblical truth. All mankind descending from Adam by ordinary generation sinned in him and fell with him in his first transgression. And so in the wisdom of God, the only begotten Son of God was conceived by the Holy Spirit so that he did not descend from Adam by ordinary generation. Jesus was conceived supernaturally. He was born naturally. Not naturally as we think of it today in natural childbirth, but he was born of a woman. Mary, the wife of Joseph, she was found to be with child. We read in our text, the Savior was born of a woman, and by this, his identity as a human being, his identity with humanity is established. Christ's conception by the Holy Spirit and being born of a woman establishes the dual natures of Christ, divine and human. We dealt with that in detail this morning. I won't belabor it tonight. 
But I will say that in connection with being born of a woman, he was born a son. Our text tells us she will give birth. She will bear a son. The angel further revealed to Joseph. Verse 21. And the gender of this child is of utmost importance to the salvation of his people. Mary didn't give birth to a daughter. She gave birth to a son. This is one of those, something of an advertisement again, of uh, what we encourage you to do on a yearly basis, to read through your Bibles. This is something that I read just this week in the book of Revelation as I'm finishing up my yearly Bible reading. It's in John's prophecy in Revelation 12 and verse 5, that emphasizes the sonship of the child that would be born. The woman in the prophecy, who is a picture of the church, a picture of the saints of all ages, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, gave birth to a son. Now that would have been enough. This, inspired, this prophecy inspired by the Spirit did not have to go on emphatically as it does and say that she gave birth to a son, a male, a male child, who is to rule all the nations with the rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God and to his throne. Now we know that to be a prophecy of the birth of Jesus Christ. And it's significant because God, in his infinite wisdom, has designed the plan of salvation to include male headship, to include federal headship. We're, uh, we're, we're familiar with this idea of federal headship. We have federal government. We have uh, representatives in our government, those who are supposed to represent us in of the government, we're familiar with this in our church governments. We have a, a federal government in our church. We have elders who are representatives of the people. We are familiar with this in our families. We have men who are the federal heads of their families. And in the biblical structure of redemption, the man Adam is the federal head the representative of all of those who remain in sin and are condemned to hell? We've said that Adam's sin is imputed. It's reckoned to everyone descending from him by ordinary generation. You'll recognize that as, as catechetical language, I hope. And so all who are born, uh, everyone is, is born guilty and, and morally corrupt. That's where every human being starts out in this life. Guilty of Adam's first sin. And that's where he remains. Unless he looks to Christ. In the biblical structure of redemption, the man, Christ Jesus, is the representative, the federal head of the redeemed. His righteousness is imputed to all who receive him by faith. Their guilt is instantaneously removed in their justification. Their moral corruption is progressively removed in their sanctification. You will remember the biblical warrant for this doctrine of federal headship. It's most clearly delineated for us in Paul's epistle to the Romans, chapter 5 and verse 12. Therefore, just as through one man, 
sin entered into the world. We know that man's name. It's Adam. And death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sinned. Now Paul moves on in his argument here in Romans chapter 5. It's a, it's a parenthetical argument. I'm picking up here in verse 17 with the transgression, Adam's transgression. For if by the transgression of the one, death reigned through the one, that is, through Adam, how much more those who receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. So then, as through one transgression there resulted condemnation to all men, so through one act of righteousness there resulted justification of life to all men, for just uh, for as through the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, even so, through the obedience of the one, the many will be made righteous. Now you can see that these two men are set up as federal heads in the scope of redemption, in the plan of redemption. And every human being is under one of these two representative heads. What's Paul trying to tell us? What's Paul saying to us as he works through this, this argument concerning the first Adam and Jesus, the second Adam? He's saying that what we need is a new representative. He's saying that what we need is a new federal head. Not our own righteousness. Not our own works. But a new representative. Through whom? Perfect righteousness. Perfect obedience will be imputed to those who put their faith in Him and Him alone for their salvation. Dear Christians, that's what we need. We need that federal representation and, and only that federal representation which will guarantee our salvation. And that is found in this one who was born a son, a male. The description of Christ's conception and birth commands all. That's the first thing that we've considered tonight together. The second thing that I want for us to consider is the meaning of these two names. The meaning of Christ's names. They fill us with hope. At least they ought to fill us with great hope. The angel of the Lord said to Joseph, verse 21, you shall call his name Jesus. What a remarkable history. The name of Jesus has in the Holy Scriptures. Jesus, the, the Greek form of the Hebrew name Joshua. Joshua or Jehoshua. The leader of the Israelite conquest of Canaan, who was, remember, a, a type, a picture of the Lord Jesus. And remember that Jehoshua means Jehovah is salvation. So the name Jesus designates this child as the Savior. That's the explicit reason given in the text for assigning this name to him. Verse 21, you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now, in order for Jesus to save his people from their sins, he must be with them. And that brings us then to that second name. Matthew emphasizes this truth, that Jesus comes into the midst of his people. Matthew emphasizes that truth in this gospel message by quoting Isaiah's prophecy, uh, that Emmanuel prophecy in verse 23 of our text. They shall call his name Emmanuel. 
Now, the Hebrew, uh, in the Hebrew, El is a proper name of God. It's shorthand for Elohim. The name that's translated uh, capital G-O-D in our English translations. Emmanuel, uh, Emmanuel means with us God, literally. Matthew translates the name for his readers uh, in order to highlight that significance. God with us. It's a name that indicates the presence of God to deliver his people. And what a precious name it is. God with us. God incarnate among us. And so God reconcilable to us. God at peace with us. So much is said during this uh, season of the year about peace on earth and goodwill toward men. That, of course, comes from the proclamation of that angelic host. What the, the angelic host declared to uh, those shepherds Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among men. I don't know how your translation reads. I didn't much uh, care for the translation that our elder read tonight. Um, not, that's not to say that it's a bad translation. It's just that all translations have their faults at one point or another, and I happen to think that that's one of the places that that particular translation is, is uh, deficient. Peace on earth among men of his good pleasure or with whom he is well pleased. Some variation of that is the way that it ought to be translated. Because God is not at peace with all men. And the angels weren't talking about peace on a horizontal plane between men and men. He was talking about peace on a vertical plane. He was talking, or they were talking about peace between God and men. And God is not at peace with those who are outside of the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no peace for them. There is no hope for them. It's found only in this child, Emmanuel, God with us. Matthew Henry comments, on our text, what a happy step is hereby taken toward the settling of peace and correspondence between God and man. That the two natures are thus brought together in the one person of the mediator. By this he, he became an unexceptionable referee fit to lay his hand on both of them since he partakes in the nature of both. Behold, in this, the deepest mystery and the richest mercy that ever was. By the light of nature, we see God as above us. By the light of the law, we see God as against us. But in the light of the gospel, we see him as Emmanuel. God with us in our nature and which is more in our interest. God with us. God among us. God in our midst. What a glorious truth. And it's this truth 
that you must learn to appropriate in your Christian experience, not during one season of the year, but in every season. Doesn't God promise to be in our midst when we assemble together every Lord's Day to worship Him? Hasn't God been in our midst in this hour? Hasn't Christ exercised His prophetic voice through the ordained instrument of preaching? Hasn't the Spirit taken the things of Christ and applied them to the hearts of His people here this evening? If He doesn't indwell His people in this way, if He's not with us in worship, then why bother to gather? We may as well stay at home. That goes for the morning service too. Christians, you must learn the full significance of God with us. Has he not been with us every day, every hour, every minute, every second of this past year? Hasn't Emmanuel been with you in your tribulations? Has he not been to you a rock and a refuge, a very present help in times of trouble? Hasn't Emmanuel been your comfort in affliction? Hasn't Emmanuel been with you in your searching of the scriptures? Hasn't he illuminated the pages of sacred scripture before your very eyes? Hasn't Emmanuel been present to convict, bringing you to repentance? Haven't you felt his restraining influence in your Christian experience? Do you know the full meaning of that name, Emmanuel, God? with us. Charles Haddon Spurgeon wrote, He who knows it best knows little of it. Alas, he who knows it not at all is ignorant indeed, so ignorant that his ignorance is not bliss, but will be his damnation. Oh, may God teach us the meaning of that name, Emmanuel, in its fullness in this coming year as we seek to walk faithfully before him. May God be with us indeed. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, we do bless your holy name for Jesus, our Redeemer, the one who is our salvation, Yehoshua. Jehovah is our salvation. You, O oh God, are our salvation. We thank you, our God and Father, that you've been pleased to come so near to us in our Savior. And even though we were not on earth when he walked the earth, that he has left us with a deposit of his presence, the very Spirit of Christ who indwells us. We thank you for the Spirit. Teach us the full significance of that name. Fill us with awe this Christmas season and every season of the year. 
by the name of Jesus, our Savior, and the name Emmanuel, the one who is indeed in our midst. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.